Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our WatchGuard webinar, MFA Experts Roundtable, Protecting Your Credentials. My name is Christine Ramsell, Marketing Specialist here at WatchGuard. I'm also joined by three presenters. First being Corey Knockreiner, CTO at WatchGuard, Alex Cagnoni, Director of Authentication, also at WatchGuard, and our special guest, Roger Grimes, MFA expert. He's also the author of A Data-Driven Computer Security Defense. So as I mentioned before, we have the experts here. I'm going to have them go over a little bit, talk about a little bit about themselves. I'm going to start off with Corey. So Corey, maybe a few sentences about yourself. Morning, everyone. My name is Corey Nockreiner. Uh, thank you for spending some time to join us today. Uh, I'm the CTO of WatchGuard. I've been here a long time. And while my CTO role has many duties, one of my passions is I run the WatchGuard Threat Lab team. So the team of researchers that kind of analyze the latest attacks. Uh, we do a lot of uh, threat research, and, and they help me do some of the demos I'll be showing later today. And I myself was a malware researcher and a network security analyst in the past. Perfect. And Alex? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining this session. My name is Alex Cagnoni. I'm the Director of Authentication for WatchGuard Technologies. Uh, I've been working with MSA for more than 20 years, so you can guess that uh, a long time ago when the only option to authenticate, to do strong authentication, was uh, a very heavy hybrid token. Uh, I was one of the co-founders of Datablink, uh, the company that was acquired by WatchGuard in 2017, and OffPoint, uh, our uh, WatchGuard's MFA solution, is my responsibility. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Alex. And, and last but not least, yep, go ahead, Roger. Yeah, Roger Grimes. Uh, I've been doing computer security for 32 years, and for much of that time I've been doing uh, – creating, installing, and hacking multi-factor authentication uh, for many different companies, Foundstone, uh, McAfee, Microsoft. Um, and I'm even uh, writing my, my latest book, or the book that I'm getting ready to write in the middle of writing is called The, uh, you know, the Many Ways to Hack Multi-Factor Authentication. That's going to be coming up from Wiley at the end of the year. All right. Thank you all. There's a little bit about the presenters, and then also, our discussion today, we're going to go over the importance of implementing MFA, different types of authentication and their weaknesses and ways to mitigate. And lastly, we're going to do some great demos live as well on a variety of authentication hacks, so definitely don't miss that. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this on to Alex to start off. Alex? Thanks, Christine. All right, so I'm going to get started talking a little bit about password security. I won't spend a lot of time in here because you're going to see a lot of uh, good stuff and you're going to learn a lot about MFA, some of the, the hacking techniques for to hack some 2FA solutions or to hack passwords. Uh, so it's going to be a fun uh, session in here. So how hard it is for a hacker to steal a password? Those are just some techniques they use to steal passwords. So the first one, the phishing emails redirecting users to fake sites. This is one of the most common ones. So one in every 99 emails is a phishing attack. So when it redirects you to a fake website, it can do usually a couple of things. It can uh, maybe direct you to a link where you download some malware to your computer, and this malware will be used to steal your, your credentials and your passwords. Or it can just be a, like a fake website. It pretends to be a real uh, a website. You're going to see that in Roger's uh, demonstration but uh, to collect the credentials of users. So it could collect and then use uh, further in the future, it could use those credentials to attack websites and different accounts. Keyloggers installed on user machines. Keyloggers basically is it's a type of malware that will uh, get everything you type in your computer. So from the moment you log into the, your computer, anything you type in your browser, so it can capture everything. Mimikatz is also malware, a very common and popular malware that dumps passwords from Windows memory. So people that log in to the Windows computer, if they have Mimikatz, it's going to dump the passwords no matter how hard those passwords are. And some of the cracking tools like brute force and dictionary attacks, really common when you hear that someone uh, got a, a database was compromised, someone stole a database from, from a bank, from a, a website. Uh, what they usually do, they use those cracking tools to try and break those hashed passwords. And even if users use sometimes combinations of words, 
dictionary attacks can be really effective uh, to, to crack those passwords. And what about complex passwords? So even if you create really complex passwords, uh, tools like Minicats uh, can really get your password. It can be like 50, uh, 50 characters long. It will still dump uh, from the memory. It will still get. And this is just an example, the threat landscape report from the first half of this year. It's in simplicity.org. It shows that uh, the second payload that was detected by our uh, uh, fireboxes in the field is Mimikatz. So people are really trying to use Mimikatz to attack computers and steal credentials. And how valuable are your identities? So this happens all the time. So recently, Equifax had to pay $700 million because of their data breach. And you saw also the recent one with Capital One, uh, Facebook that, that issue they had that uh, a, a file with millions of users' passwords in plain text was found there. Uh, so what happens with that? Are they going to use to deface your Facebook? Are they going to put anything in your Facebook? No, they're going to use those passwords to try to get into your personal uh, email account, for example. Once they're in your personal email account, they can change the password, and they can use it to reset your online account passwords as well. So they can really take over a lot of stuff in your digital life. Citrix also had an issue that was reported recently. Uh, FBI advised that hackers use a technique called password spraying. So basically, they were using easy passwords. They were trying to get into Citrix network, and it looks like there were some users with easy passwords, so they were able to get inside their network. Reddit was a really an interesting case. You're going to see a demo on how you can hack SMS-based authentication. It was really interesting because uh, they said after they, uh, some accounts were hacked, they said, well, we thought that we had uh, multi-factor authentication, but SMS doesn't seem to be really effective for that. And another uh, interesting hack recently, uh, one, you can see uh, the story also in secplicity.org, is uh, the hackers were accessing MS MSSP accounts so they could target their managed accounts. And some of those said that they're going to make it mandatory for their operators to use two-factor authentication. So those are just some examples of breaches and issues related to passwords and why some, some of those uh, some of those 2FA solutions like SMS are not really effective. So with that, I would like to pass uh, to Roger so he can talk a little bit about MFA. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, so what is multi-factor authentication and why is it needed? Uh, you know, most people know what it is, but I want to cover it real quick in this talk, is that multi-factor authentication means you have these one or more factors of authentication that you present to prove your identity or ownership of the identity. The three classic ones are something that you know, something that you have, something that you are, something you know would be a password or a pen or your connecting dots on the screen or something like that, something you have. That would be like a USB token a smart card, uh, RFID transmitter, some type of dongle or things like that. And then something you are is like biometrics, you know, fingerprints, retina scan, or even uh, years ago I worked on a, a U.S. Army project where they were attempting to see if they could uh, tell the difference between different people based upon their smell for authentication. The idea is they would walk through something that looked like a, you know, a, 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 like a scanner at an airport, but it would, it would sniff you and find out, you know, it, it, see if they could identify you biometrically based on smell. But I laugh because it failed because it turns out we all smell different every day, especially if you've been drinking or you ate a lot of garlic. Uh, but increasingly, those are the three main factors. And in order for to get the best benefit, you want to have combinations of those factors. You know, you want to, you don't want to just have a whole bunch of things that you know, like, hey, you've got to put in a password and a pen and connect the dots. It's better if you mix up the factors because it's more difficult for an attacker or an adversary to compromise two or more of these things. And now there's increasingly kind of a more factors in the traditional three, what's called contextual factors or behavioral factors. Um, that, you know, it's like the, a lot of people don't know, but when you're logging into, let's say, uh, Google or Hotmail or something like that, Gmail or Hotmail, they actually look at hundreds and hundreds of different factors. Like, you know, are you coming from the same device that you've normally come in from? Are you coming from the same IP address? Are you in the same country? Are you, you know, could you have physically have been in America and now two hours later in China? 
uh, even how fast you type in your password and, and how fast each letter of the password is typed in. A lot of people don't know, but when you go to those login screens that have the, hey, put your login name here, hit next, and then you're asked for your password, they're actually measuring and timing how long it takes you to put in your password and the different keystrokes, how long, how long it takes you normally to get from, you know, your R to your O in your name or something like that. Uh, so there's a lot of these other factors going on. So you'll hear things like when people say they not only have, you know, two-factor, three-factor, four-factor, but you'll hear seven-factor and ten-factor and things like that. You know, if you have one factor, it's called single factor. If you have two factors, it's called two factor. If you have multi-factors, that can be two or three factors. Uh, but just remember, you really want to mix up the factors. You don't want to use, the, you know, or it's not nearly as strong to use the same type of factor, you know. If I use different types of factors, like something I know and something I have, it's just much more difficult for a hacker to get to that sort of information. And as we start to talk about multi-factor authentication and hacking it, uh, realize that there's three different pieces to it. There's always this identity label that you or a device on your behalf is submitting uh, that's saying this is my identity or this is a label that represents my identity within this namespace. And it has to be unique. And, you know, whether you're in Active, in Active Directory Forest or you're on the Internet, you know, DNS, you know, like all of us have uh, unique email addresses that are unique across the entire, you know, Internet through DNS. If we're in an Active Directory environment, our login name or user principal name has to be unique in the forest. If you're in an LDAP system or an Apple system or whatever, whatever it is where you're authenticating, you have to provide this unique identity that ties you to a particular identifier within the system. Then you have to provide one or more factors to authenticate and prove that you have ownership of that particular identity and identity label. And if you get successfully authenticated, then you go into a process that's called authorization. And that's where any time that your identity or, or, or some application or device on your behalf is trying to uh, access a protected object, you know, like a, a file protected, you know, file or folder or website or something like that, there is some type of access control mechanism that looks at what's called your access control token. Every time you successfully authenticate, you're actually handed this access control token. It could be in the form of, you know, Windows. It could be an LM or NTLM or Kerberos ticket or token. On a website, it's usually a text-based cookie. But every time you log in successfully, you're then given this access control token. And when you go to access a protected resource, that's what you're handing over to that access control mechanism. That literally is like your ticket. It says, I am who I say I am and I'm successfully authenticated, and here are the rights and privileges and permissions and things like that. could be other stuff in there um, that, that, that I'm allowed to have that determines whether or not that access control mechanism will let you protect access that, that file or folder or website or whatever. But here's the huge important point, and if you're falling asleep, pay attention here because this is almost nobody understands this. Less than 1% of computer security people understand this, and you will today after you hear the slide. Is that no matter how you authenticate, whether it's you know one factor, two factor, ten factor, no matter how you authenticate, whether it was a login name and password, or a fingerprint, or a smart card, or an RFID, you know tag or something like that, once you log in successfully, we're all given basically the same type of access control token. And again, by that I mean is if I'm on a Windows laptop and I'm logging in using a password, or I'm logging in using a fingerprint, or I'm logging in using you know FIDO USB key. Once I log on in, I am given in Windows some type of Windows-based access control token that says I'm successfully authenticated, and that token is going to be probably NT, an NT token, NTLM token, or a Kerberos ticket. If I'm connecting to a website, no matter how I authenticate it to that website, at some point I'm going to be given this access control token, this cookie, and the cookie is just text-based. Uh, that has a unique identifier in it for this particular session that's tied to back, back to my unique identity. And anyone that can get access to that access control token, that session token, essentially can become me. So that's a very important thing to remember is that, you know, once we've successfully authenticated, the act of authorization is, 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 is different. And, and a lot of times the 2FA hacks and the multi-factor hacks are trying to break into the differences between the different layers there. Uh, but we're going to talk a lot about MFA and 2FA and hacking MFA. You'll see some videos today that, you know, some people will come away going, uh, wow, uh, MFA is not nearly as secure as I thought. 
that's not true. All things considered equally, MFA is usually better than 1FA. You want to use it, you know, where it makes sense. You don't want to use it like to go on Google and do a search for cat videos or something. But on all places where you have private or sensitive information, personal or for your company, MFA is better than 1FA, and we should strive to use MFA whenever it's possible, where it makes sense and where it's possible. There's no single multi-factor authentication method that works with everything, so you're always going to be forced to use a combination of things, at least right now. What this talk is about, though, is that MFA, as good as it is, it isn't unhackable. And if someone tells you something, there's nothing in this world that's unhackable. And if someone tells you something's unhackable, they're lying to you or naive, and either way, you don't want to deal with them. Well, that's what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about multi-factor authentication being a good thing, but it's still not unhackable, and we're going to show you some of the ways that MFA can be hacked. But don't get disillusioned and think, well, MFA is useless and I, and I don't need it. MFA is still a very good thing, and I'm, I'm so excited for this talk today. I really am, and, and glad everybody's shown up. And now I'm going to hand it off. So, yeah, thank, thanks, Roger. So let's talk about uh, some of the MFA methods that are available. I'm not going to talk about uh, each one, every each one, because there's, there's a lot but the most common ones in here. So the first one I want to talk is about SMS as a token. This is a very common one still used uh, a lot, especially in the U.S. Uh, the problem with SMS as a token is that it, it's insecure. It was deprecated by NIST. It's considered to be insecure for different reasons. You're going to see just one, one of the ways that it can be hacked. The Reddit hack shows the risk, and it also depends on carrier coverage. So if you're traveling, if you're abroad, Sometimes the SMS won't uh, get to your phone or it will be delayed. So it's not the best way to authenticate. Hardware LTP tokens, uh, we're talking here about those uh, key fobs that you usually carry. It, it changes the, the OTP or the one time password every 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Uh, they're expensive, hard to carry. Uh, there's all the logistics. People are working from home or remote offices, you have to send it over. You have to wait for uh, for that to arrive, so it's not really uh, the best the best way uh, or the best approach to use. People can can lose those tokens, and I'm talking about the time-based uh, OTP tokens. There's also another category of of tokens, which are the event-based OTP tokens. Those are not in use anymore. There's still a few vendors using that, but event-based is not as secure because. Uh, the OTP is valid for a long period of time until you use uh, the OTP, while the time-based OTP tokens, they have to be used at the same time. Hardware USB tokens, uh, they have the same characteristics of, of, of an OTP token. I mean, they are expensive. You have to distribute. It's, you have all the logistics uh, involved sometimes. It might need drivers for you to, uh, to install and use in your computer. And it's not really the best option if, you're, if you need to authenticate using your smartphone or using your tablet because uh, there's no USB connection. So you have to use something like NFC, and it starts getting complicated, complex, and more expensive with that. Desktop OTP tokens are also not, not very secure because they are installed in your Windows machine. As we know, there's a lot of uh, attacks to, to Windows, a lot of... Uh, viruses uh, and that could potentially steal or try to clone your desktop OTP token. And it cannot be used, for example, if you want to protect your Windows login. A Windows login with username and password, if you want to add uh, multi-factor authentication to that, you cannot do because you have to be inside and logged into your computer in order to use the OTP token. And it's not very portable as well. Uh, just imagine that you're in a cab going to the airport. You have to access a website, um, a website where uh, uh, you need to authenticate. You need to use a uh, one-time password. What's going to happen? It's, you, you're going to have to open your computer in order to uh, get your OTP. So it's not really practical. Uh, Google Authenticator is also a very, uh, a very common use for consumers. So people using Facebook, uh, protecting your Gmail account, different uh, consumer accounts, they might use something called Google Authenticator. It's basically uh, uh, activated through a QR code. All the seed, everything is in this QR code. You activate, and then it generates a one-time password every 30 or 60 seconds. 
but there's no back end. So this is a, a very useful for consumers to protect their personal accounts, but it's not something that usually ap applies for business accounts. One of the things that people are using more and more and migrating to is to push based mobile tokens where you receive uh, uh, your authentication request into an, uh, to this application. So it's all encrypted, you receive, and you have contact information, like, for example, where you're trying to authenticate from, uh, which type of resource you're trying to access. And, and Gartner used to say, it's saying a lot that uh, there, it's a common migration path from things like SMS or hardware OTP tokens to push-based mobile tokens because you, you can carry with yourself. Almost everyone has a smartphone, so it's, it's the best uh, usability. And what about biometrics? Biometrics as passwordless authentication. It's a, it's a good usability. So you use biometrics and, and maybe it unlocks your passwords like we, we're hearing that Google is, is trying to do. Now, it's a better usability. What about security? So some solutions, what happens is that they use the minutia. For example, when you use the fingerprint, it can, it's going to store uh, information about your fingerprint. Uh, whenever you're trying to apply for uh, a biometric login, it's going to start, it's going to ask you to put your finger and capture information about your finger. This is the minutia. What happens if the minutia is stolen? So your biometrics cannot be revoked. You cannot just uh, chop your finger off and then put, it's going to grow another one. So it's, it's something that has to be discussed. Whenever you're going to a biometric solution, you have to analyze uh, if this is really secure, if it, how it's the usability. Liveness technology helps, but it's not 100% effective, as you're going to see uh, in this demo. And most analysts, if you talk to an analyst, they're going to suggest, well, if you're going to a, a biometrics, uh, authentication, you should at least use two types of combined biometrics, like face and voice, or face and fingerprint, face and behavior. So combining those to, to be much more secure. So with that, I would like to pass to, to Corey. Uh, he's going to show some interesting things about biometrics. Cool. Thank you, Alex. And as Alex mentioned, uh, biometrics are a great Sorry about that. Hopefully we're back. Uh, as, I, as Alex mentioned, biometrics are a, a great single factor of authentication for usability. We definitely encourage you to use biometrics because they make logging in every day kind of easy. But the fear I see happening in the industry is a lot of the industry is trying to use biometrics as a single factor. You see a lot of OS providers uh, like Microsoft has started Hello, where they use a biometric to log in. But right now they seem to be using it like a single factor, which I believe is going to lead to the same mistakes we did with passwords. Any token, the tokens that Roger mentioned, whether they're something you are, something you have, or something you know, can be uh, pulled from you or stolen or lost or hacked, as you'll see. So one example is facial ID, which has become pretty big. Uh, Apple loaded uh, face ID onto their phones, and then many vendors, including Google and Android providers, followed. And, and Android has something called trusted faces. So I'm going to quickly show you a video of how uh, someone might use something called trusted face to buy, uh, authenticate to an Android phone. After we watch this video, just to show you there's no smoke and mirrors in the authentication, I'll go ahead and do the particular hack you're about to see a second time live on webcam. In this video, I'm going to show you how easy it is to bypass the biometric trusted face uh, facial identification that Android uses for multi-factor on many of its phones. Now, first of all, if I can get this to focus, you can see it's a LG G5 phone, which is one of the many models vulnerable to this. Now, to do this demo, we have to get a helpful assistant to register trusted face. So they go into settings general, and you can see here they're going to smart lock. They do have to enter their pin code. By the way, don't use that pin code ever. And here you can see trusted face, and they're going to go ahead and head up, set up trusted face uh, by entering their face, as you can see here. 
And just like that, they've set up their face to register with the phone. Now, after doing this, you also have options to improve the facial tracking by entering different angles of your face and doing it a number of different times just to improve the amount of angles it detects, which our model did a number of times. So now her face is registered on the phone. Now, just to show you it works, here her phone is locked, pointed away from her, but you can see she's not touching the, the front keyboard, but if she points it at her face while unlocking her phone, now we can see just like that, without entering a pin, it's unlocked and there we're in her phone. Now let's see what happens in an attacker's hands. And right now the phone is unlocked, as you hopefully can see here, but I'm going to go ahead and lock it. So if we can get this to focus, you can see I now need to swipe to unlock, which either requires a passcode, or because we have trusted face enabled, if I look at this with the right face, I should be able to unlock it. But unfortunately, my face is not the right face, so you can see that this phone is still locked. However, I do have a picture of the person we saw set up trusted face for. So even though this phone is still locked, if I go ahead and point it at this, just like that, we unlock the phone. All I need to do now is swipe and I'm in. Now you might be saying that was a pretty high resolution picture. Well, guess what? I also have a very low resolution picture I grabbed from a social network. So here, if the phone focuses, you can see it is locked again, but now we're going to have the phone look at this low resolution picture. And even with that low resolution picture, I have unlocked the Android device. So that's how easy it is to bypass trusted face on many phones. In fact, researchers have found that around 40% of Android phones out there, the ones using 2D cameras rather than some sort of three-dimensional mapping or depth mapping of the face, are vulnerable to this, and you can easily get past trusted face. So hopefully that demo worked out okay, but just to show you there's no smoke and mirrors, I have the same phone here. I'm going to go ahead and lock the phone. Uh, so hopefully you can see there that it says swipe to unlock. But as you can see, I also have that picture I showed before. And all I have to do is point the phone at the picture and I'm unlocked. Uh, once I'm unlocked, all I have to do is swipe in and I'm in the phone. So as you can see, trusted face, at least on phones, certain phones with 2D cameras, is not that secure. Uh, so you, you should not trust biometrics 100%. So that's why I don't recommend it as a single factor of authentication. To talk a little bit more about Trusted Face, just so you know, that phone was actually an Android 8 phone, although it does work on newer versions of Android 2. Uh, when you set up Trusted Face, Google actually warns you that, hey, the security of this isn't perfect. Are you sure you want to authenticate uh, to your phone with the face? So Google is aware of it. Uh, you might have heard in the video, uh, in January 1st, Dutch researchers released details where they uh, basically analyzed 110 different phones, lots of different models, including up-to-date models, and they found around 40% of those phones were vulnerable to this kind of hack. And you also saw in the video, uh, you know, the attacker doesn't have to have a perfect picture of the person. Uh, if you do, like, for instance, steal someone's phone, and you happen to know who they are, you can often go to social media and get a picture, even a low-resolution picture that will work. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, <laughs> earlier, Alex mentioned something called liveness detection. Some models of phones did implement something called liveness detection, which rather than just looking for a static image, they looked for some sort of motion or, or something in the image to prove that it was a live image. And in Android's trusted face case, uh, they actually used a blink. So they were looking for people blinking. What's funny about that, though, is even liveness detection wasn't a very strong authenticator. One researcher actually took the picture he was using to unlock a phone. He used Photoshop just to put some fake eyelids over the person. And then he made an animated GIF that just switched between the open eyes and the closed eyes very quickly. And that alone was enough to defeat uh, liveness detection. So that is not perfect either. The final thing I want to say is these are all with phones that are just using your normal 2D camera to do facial ID. 
there are phones out there. iPhone in particular has something called Face ID, and there are some Android models that do have the same type of 3D depth camera. These are cameras that shoot a whole bunch of IR lights at your face. They essentially get a 3D map of your face. Long story short, the facial ID of those particular phones that have the 3D depth camera are much stronger than, than these 2D cameras. That said, trusted face isn't the only issue. If you go through the history of new biometrics, at every step, researchers have found ways to kind of evade them. For instance, fingerprints. That was one of the first things we all used on our phones and computers. Well, way back ten, over 10 years ago, Japanese researchers showed how if you pull the fingerprint using normal methods, you could melt down gummy candies like gummy bears, and you see a picture in the top right there where they had a mold for a fingerprint. They usually, they basically just used a gummy candy in that mold, and that gummy candy could defeat a fingerprint identification. I also mentioned Face ID. I do think Face ID with its 3D camera is one of the strongest forms of, of facial ID right now on a consumer product. That said, even Face ID was cracked two weeks after it was released. In the lower right, you see a picture of a, a mask. Uh, basically a 3D printed mask with more detail on the nose, mouth, and eyes that a Vietnamese research group called BACV created. And that particular mask was able to defeat face ID. So the point is, there's nothing wrong with biometrics as a factor, but you have to realize that every single factor could have issues. They could be stolen, they could be replicated, they could be lost. So that's why multi-factor, while also not perfect, does at least make it a lot harder for an attacker to get multiple factors. With that, I think I'll turn it back to Alex. Thanks, Corey. So uh, that's that's great information. And uh, about Google Authenticator, uh, uh, a lot of people ask me, well, is, is it safe? Should I use it in my company? Well, it's free. Should I just take this technology and start using my company? One thing I'd like to say is that Google Authenticator is a, it's a good solution for consumers, but you have to be careful as a consumer. Why is that? Because the QR code, when you activate your Google Authenticator, it doesn't matter if it's in their own application or if you can even uh, activate your personal token in North Point. But once you do that, just make sure that the QR code that's used to activate, it's, it's deleted from your machine. Nobody captures that because this QR code has all the information needed to create your token, which means that if you try, and you can do it at home, uh, just try and get two uh, different mobile phones, maybe one mobile phone and a tablet, and use uh, Google Authenticator software. You can use Outpoint for that, and read the same QR code in two different uh, devices. What's going to happen is that you're going to have a cloned token. It's going to generate exactly the same uh, sequence of OTPs of one-time passwords on those different devices because all you need is the time and the secret key and the secret key is inside this QR code. So it, you have to be careful with that. Now for business applications you have to be aware that uh, Google Authenticator solution doesn't have the back-end uh, part of it. So how do you integrate with your firewall? There's no radius back-end, there's no SAML protocol in order for you to do a web single sign-on. So it's just like this technology that you can use, for example, in your website for consumer applications. So it's, it's a good solution. Uh, as Roger mentioned, it's better than using 1FA. Uh, it's good to protect your personal accounts with that, but it's not the best solution or the most indicated solution for uh, business applications. Okay, and with that, I'm passing again to Roger to talk a little bit about FIDO and FIDO2. So, uh, you know, the FIDO, uh, new FIDO and FIDO2 standards are new, very good two-factor authentication solutions that are supported, or standards, really, that are supported by many uh, different vendors now. And they essentially, many of their, their passwordless, they don't use passwords, um, passwordless based uh, 2FA tokens uh, that you can use. You literally register your token with uh, different websites, uh, and that and it, it's a very secure form of um, two-factor authentication. It's spreading around the world. Microsoft Windows uh, participates with it and is adopting it. Uh, but I've been to a couple of conferences. I went to B-Sides in Orlando, B-Sides Orlando, I think it was, or B-Sides Tampa a while ago, and I saw two researchers get up there and hack FIDO 2.0 right after it came out. 
uh, using a similar type of attack that I'm going to show you in just a minute uh, with a video with one of my uh, co-founders, uh, Kevin Mitnick, uh, uh, showed co-founders that know before. Uh, did he's our uh, Kevin Mitnick is the world's most infamous uh, you know hacker is what you'll hear. Uh, although he you know he hacked back in the 80s, he's been a known good white hat hacker uh, since the 90s, since the late 90s. Um, and he did this demo uh, for uh, one of our presentations, and it showed how even though you could log in with a really good 2FA solution, uh, doesn't mean that they can't still still the resulting access control token. Uh, and when we demoed that for the first time, we had many, many uh, news reporters and people like that call us and email us, and they wanted to know how do we reported this as a new vulnerability. You know, oh, my God, you're hacking these, you know, 2FA in this particular demo. It's a Microsoft LinkedIn website he's showing it on. And we're like, no, no, this is the, you know, being able to steal these access control tokens after someone successfully authenticates, no matter how they authenticate, has been possible for decades. And uh, people came back and said, well, you hacked LinkedIn, you know, but you couldn't hack, you know, a Gmail site. Then he hacked a Gmail site, and then he hacked a PayPal site, and then he packed all, <laughs> hacked all these other sites using the same method. So, again, what we're getting ready to show you or what Kevin's getting ready to show you is a demo of somebody uh, doing two-factor authentication to a website, but because he tricked them into a man-in-the-middle site with a proxy web server, they're able to steal all the information that the person types in and all the information that the, uh, the, the, the website sends back, including the access control token, and then take over that person's session. So it's a pretty cool demo to see. Again, is an example of the most common type of hacking you'll see. Kevin Mitnick, uh, know before is chief hacking, hacking officer. And a lot of people ask me if they enable two-factor authentication on the websites that they use, does that stop phishing attacks? And let's take a look at that. So what exactly is two-factor authentication? That's when you log into a website, for example, and not only do you have to put in your username and password, but the website actually sends you a code via SMS, or you might have an application on your mobile device that displays a code that you have to enter into the website to log in. And that is proving that you actually have your mobile device. So it's a form of authentication that's based on something that you have, and your password is something that you know. So a good friend of mine developed this demo, um, Kuba Gretzky, that demonstrates how a bad guy could fish you even though you've enabled two-factor authentication. So let's take a look at, at how this works. So I'm logged into my Gmail account, and if you take a look in the second email here, um, I'll go ahead and open it. It appears to be an email from LinkedIn. And ordinarily, when somebody wants to join your network on LinkedIn, LinkedIn will actually send an email to your email address notifying you of that. And if you're interested, you can go ahead and click interested, log into your uh, LinkedIn account, and authorize that person to actually become a connection. So if we take a look here, we have an email from LinkedIn that says, Kevin, I've read about your adventures and Ghost in the Wires and so on, and this person wants to join my network. But this is actually a phishing attack. If we take a look here at where the email is originating from, it's not at linkedin.com, it's at this domain called llnked.com, which people might overlook. So let's go ahead and pretend that we're the victim here and go ahead and click on interested. And what that is going to do, it's gonna redirect us to the LinkedIn website to go ahead and log in. But let's move this over to the right and let that load. And if you take a look over here, we have a blank white page, which is gonna become very important in a moment. And this is the attacker um, terminal session. So let's go ahead and bring back the virtual machine that's now connected to LinkedIn to authenticate because we, again, clicked on interested in the email. So we'll go ahead and put in a username, Johnny Boy at mitniksecurity.com. And now we're gonna go ahead and put in our secret password. And now we're gonna go ahead and click sign in. And we click, when we click sign in, it's not gonna allow us to log in. What LinkedIn is gonna do is request 
our two-factor authentication code that LinkedIn is gonna actually send to my mobile phone. And in a moment, you should hear a sound that the text message was received on my mobile phone. So let's go ahead and click sign in. And here we go. It's uh, telling us that two-step authentication is enabled. We just heard a message come into my mobile device. We're gonna uncheck this box that says recognize this device in the future. And I'm gonna open my mobile, mobile device to take a look and see what the text message is, or what the code is rather. So the code here is 421, 476. We're gonna go ahead and click verify. And when we do so, it's gonna log us into my LinkedIn account. So now we're logged into the LinkedIn account, but let's take a look at the attacker session over here on the left. So we're gonna scoot this over to the right. And over here, what we have is what we're able to intercept. So we're able to intercept the email address, which is johnnyboy at mitniksecurity.com. We're also able to insert, intercept the password to the account, which is no before rocks. And over here, this is not the actual six digit code that was intercepted because you can't really use the six digit code again, the second factor. But what we're able to do is intercept the session cookie. And if you're able to steal the session cookie, or if rather the attacker is able to do so, they don't even need your username or password or second factor code. They could simply load the session key into a browser and they actually become you. So let me show you how this works. We're gonna highlight the cookie. We're gonna copy it to the clipboard. And then we're simply gonna open up Chrome in incognito mode. And incognito mode just means uh, with privacy. So now we're gonna to go to the real LinkedIn website. And when we go here, obviously we're not authenticated. Now it's, you know, wants us to log in with our credentials, but we don't have to do so. We're gonna go ahead and go into developer tools. We're gonna go into the console. And what we're gonna paste into the console is the session cookie that we stole from the victim, which was myself, by the way. I'm gonna enter it. I'm gonna head and close the session. Now, all I simply have to do to be logged in to the victim's account with their session cookie is simply hit refresh now. So I hit refresh and here we are, we've logged in or rather hacked my own account. So will two-factor authentication actually stop phishing attacks? Well, you can see that the answer is simply no. So what do you need to do to protect your organization? Well, of course, you need to have user education and training. That's a no-brainer. But you also have to conduct simulated phishing attacks. So you can inoculate your users against this type of risk. And more importantly, you have to stop. You have to look and think before you click that link. Pretty wild, huh? I mean, that's uh, most people that see that's the first time just can't believe uh, that goes to show you that just because you get a two-factor authentication of some sort, whether it's a token or whatever, you can't just forget that you can be still be fished. A lot of people think, oh, I've got two-factor authentication, I can't be fished. And, you know, that's not the truth. I can send you what looks like a relatively uh, simple phishing email, and if I trick you into coming to my bogus website, I can use it as a proxy to capture all the information sent in to you from the client. Lots of ways to prevent it, uh, but it is among the most common ways that multi-factor authentication is bypassed. So it's, uh, and this works against many, many different types of multi-factor authentication. But I'll turn this over to, to, for our next demo. All right, I think there might be a slide for, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah, I just want a, a quick recap on SMS as a token. So is it secure? So the good thing about SMS as a token is that it doesn't require extra hardware or software. It works on any mobile phone that you might have. 
Now, the problem with that is that it's uh, susceptible to several attacks, rats, sim sim sap, uh, swapping, so you're going to see some of those. It's not user-friendly, especially if you're trying to authenticate using an application on your phone, and then you have to switch between applications in order to see uh, the SMS and the, the one-time password. And it also depends on the carrier network. Carrier network, it might not work really well if you're, uh, when it's uh, in roaming. So let's see, let's see how you can hack SMS with Corey. Hey guys, I'm going to show you a quick demo of how uh, Android-based malware, such as a remote access Trojan, can hijack your text or SMS messages, which might allow someone to actually hijack your two-factor authentication if you're using text-based authentication. In this demo, we have two phones. You can see them both here. On this side is the victim phone, which is an Android device. Over here, we have an iOS or an iPhone. This is actually the attacker's phone, and he's designed some malware, which is already on this Android phone, that will forward all the Android device's text messages to the attacker's phone. So before we actually pop into the phones, let me go ahead and bring up a website. Uh, I'm going to go to, let's say, Reddit. In this case, I'm actually using a fake Reddit page that my threat team has created. And as you can see, like many pages, Reddit has a login. I'm going to go ahead and log in with my username and password. However, when I log in, it's asking me for an OTP, a one-time password. Uh, and in fact, this Android phone, if we go ahead and unlock it, you can actually see the one-time password, let me get this out of the way, the one-time password has been sent to this phone. So you can imagine if I were a, a user who someone had figured out my password, maybe in a data breach, they still need this OTP. And if the attacker didn't have the OTP because they don't have my phone, if I tried to submit that, authentication is going to fail. So let's go ahead and stop that and just refresh this page to try to log in again. So let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, it looks like we have we lost the audio again. So uh, we're going to continue in here. I don't know if it was showed uh, if it showed all the the hack, but basically what happened is that it was a, there was a uh, malware there that uh, redirected the SMS message to the other phone. So the the attacker, if they know the credential of the original user, they could just uh, and if they have the malware installed on the target user, uh, the malware will redirect the SMS. So the attacker. Uh, could log into the account. Maybe the user wasn't even looking at the at their phone, and uh, they would receive the SMS. But at the same time, it would be redirected, and the attacker would get into the account. So this is the this is the the whole video. And Corey wanted to show it live, but he lost connection with the voice. I tried to put here the, also the the video, but it's uh, for some reason it lost the connection here. So. Uh, Text or SMS-based uh, authentication, when, where he's trying to reconnect text of our SMS-based authentication, is insecure like, like we, we saw in here. There are several attacks. There are rats that can do more than that. It can uh, use geolocation to show the location of the user as well. It can redirect text, notifications, uh, things like that. It can really, uh, really redirect everything that you're doing over your phone. So SMS is one of the most targeted applications because uh, still a lot of applications are using SMS to authenticate. So key, some key takeaways. Uh, Corey was going to talk a little bit about that, but again, some key takeaways if you're implementing multi-factor authentication. Uh, uh, if you're doing biometrics, you have to be careful, analyze the solution, take a look if this is the most secure one. Sometimes it's better to combine two different uh, biometric solutions. SMS is not the best solution to, to be used. You should be uh, looking into migrating to something. Like, for example, push-based authentication. When you use push-based authentication, that's when you receive an authentication request on your app. It's an encrypted connection from uh, the messaging system directly to your app. 
So there's no way to intercept that. And if we implement it the, the right way, way it's going to show this information. Oh, he's back. Good, good. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, you can finish your thought. I just wanted to see if you could hear me. And by the way, if, the, if, if there's appetite for it, I can reshow the live demo at the end of our, our questions just so people can see it. Sorry, I'm not sure exactly why the audio dropped. Okay, go ahead. So, so. I, so you had great key takeaways. You know, some other things I'd mention is uh, while MFA is hackable, in fact, maybe I can show you the text message one again, it usually requires a lot of extra steps that's harder for the attacker, like the one Roger showed, which is basically session or token ID theft. You're not actually hacking the MFA implementation itself, but you're, you're hacking the way the either operating system or, in the case they were showing, the website implements session IDs. So, for instance, Windows might use Kerberos, and if you have local access to a machine, you can do things like capture Kerberos tickets and replay them. But the key thing for those type of hacks you need to realize is the bad guy already has to have significant access to your machine or network connection. For Kerberos hacks, they actually have to have admin on one of your machines in order to be able to grab Kerberos tickets. Uh, one thing to note for the phishing attack that Kevin Mitnick was showing is if you actually implement session IDs and HTTPS, it makes it much harder. For, well, first of all, the bad guy has to man in the middle you either through phishing or a Wi-Fi attack. So the guy has to be redirecting your network traffic through them. But the second thing is there's ways to actually protect that session ID. HTTPS is one of them. Depending on how they implement HTTPS, there's ways to do HTTPS stripping. But they're getting harder and harder as, as uh, operating systems and BIOSes increase to the latest versions of TLS 1.3. So there are quite a few ways, HTTPS being one of them, of trying to protect that session ID, making it harder. So a uh, multi-factor, while never perfect, just like Roger says, it's definitely much better than the alternative. Yeah, and the problem of HTTPS, like in the, in the Kevin demo, is that you know, almost all websites today certainly do an authentication of HTTPS, but his fake website didn't. So Kevin's proxy is implementing HTTPS in between the proxy and the real website. It's just not between Kevin, you know, Kevin's proxy website and the victim's. And the victim doesn't notice. You know, people just don't, you know, they're so used to seeing the lock icon up there, they don't even really look for it. And that's the problem. Uh, there are, you know, and other ways to do it is you can pre-register the device, like FIDO 2.0 would prevent that type of attack. Um, and there, there's a couple other ways to, to pre prevent that type of attack. But probably key to it is that they can all be hacked and all gotten around, and you have to still pay attention, right? And in that particular, the Kevin hack demo, you know, it was as simple as sending a regular phishing email, you know, and it, it, it pulled off very quickly. It's even automated today with a lot of hacking tools. And you just, you know, you have to be aware that, uh, multi-factor authentication doesn't mean that you can't be hacked. Cool. So with that, uh, would you like me to try to redo the, the demo in like one minute, a super version of it, or would you like to dive the questions? Christine? Yeah. Um, it looks like we have a lot of requests for you to do the de live demo, so let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go really fast. On the left-hand side is the victim phone. On the right-hand side is the attacker phone. And I'm, I'm going to do a SMS OTP hijack. Uh, you, this might be a repeat. You might have heard some of this before. Do know there's already malware on the victim phone. I talk about in a video version of this how malware might get on, so we'll find a way to release that video to see the full one. But I just want you to see, say an attacker stole SecAdept's password from a database breach, and I was dumb enough to use it everywhere. Well, this site coolly uses OTP. It's actually going to text the victim phone with the OTP message. But because of that malware, you can also see the attacker phone has a copy of that message. The attacker phone, which I'm looking at now, can see the phone number where that message came from and actually also sees the OTP code. So again, uh, even if you have some, some multi-factor, realize that not all multi-factor is created equally. This is why Alex said NIST has canceled the use of text-based OTP is because of the fact that, you know, with malware, it can be forwarded to other phones. And also, by the way, uh, even without malware, if a bad guy gets access to a carrier network using things like SS7, they can capture uh, uh, the, uh, the clear 
the clear text SMS message too. So realize SMS, you know, again, if you have no other options, multi-factor even with SMS is better than nothing. But do know that that's why NIST is kind of saying don't use it because text-based uh, multi-factor OTPs are pretty dead. Uh, I will say, by the way, this required malware on the phone. There are lots of ways that my video talks about you might get it. But realize permissions are important. When you install things, especially if you're installing from an unknown third-party source, every time you install something in Android, it asks you for permission. That type of malware needs read permissions to, one, text messages. That's how it's kind of copying text messages, but also notifications. So why notifications? Well, a while ago, to fix this OTP kind of leaking problem, uh, Google and Android carriers changed kind of their SDK and their API for text messages. So when you get a two-factor OTP via a text message, it usually has a different kind of ID to it, and they basically removed the ability for read permissions to see 2FA text messages. You'll only see it from normal phone numbers. However, Notifications doesn't do that. Whenever you get a text message, while your message app might uh, per not permit people to read 2FA text messages, it will still pop up that notification telling you you got it and showing you the message. So what bad guys did is they now have read permissions to notifications to get the OTP there. So just be aware that is one issue with SMS based, and, and it shows how multi-factor might be hacked. Uh, by the way, what should you do about that? Well, Alex talked about different multi-factor. Not all multi-factor is created equal. For instance, ours uses push-based authentication. So it's a encrypted HTTPS message to the phone. On top of that, we're not just using a, a OTP and, and your password or a, a key on your phone and your password. We're using things like device ID and other indicators that help us know that it's actually your hardware to really add other factors to that authentication. So hopefully the demo worked that time. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time.